Welcome to Juniper Tree Ministries. The Juniper Tree Podcast is a first stage in a healing ministry supporting faith and healing through the Word of God. The Word of God is alive and active, and verse-by-verse study through the Bible can heal, help, and lead to a victorious life. Now here's Pastor Michael with this week's message in Revelation chapter 18, verse 8. Thanks for tuning in again. We're going to be uh, in Revelation chapter 18, verse 8. It says, Therefore, in one day her plagues will overtake her, death, mourning, and famine. She'll be consumed by fire for the mighty Lord God who judges her. So we know that uh, Babylon's going to be destroyed in an hour, that it won't take long. We talked a little bit over the year about the past couple weeks about the horror of Babylon and all the different things that are taking place. It says in verse 9, When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe, woe to you, great city, you mighty city of Babylon, in one hour your doom has come. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron and marble. Cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense and myrrh and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages, and human beings sold as slaves. The third reason, Babylon offers everything. The world tells us what's in style. We conform and we do what they say we should do and we follow what Babylon would say. Everything of Babylon will be destroyed The carriages, they're all over the TV today. Lexus, Mercedes, BMWs, all possessions now will possess them as they are destroyed. And it's funny how much government controls the media. All the commercials and all the things I've seen on social media lately. How much the government is in control of that. The government wants to control what we believe, the school systems and what they're taught, all the different things that are taking place so that you will follow what the government wants you to follow, what the one world order one day will want you to follow as well. Jesus said in Matthew 6, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 16, 26. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? That's what Jesus said. It's a love story, and a bride will come all out of this. The system around us wants us to possess the souls of men and lives are devalued as we see abortion and our courts fighting over their lives. Evolution evolution devalues life. With creationism, there's no moral accountability. Lenin said, who cares if two thirds of the world is killed in nuclear war as long as the third that's left is communist. The Bible says differently. The soul is most important, more important than the universe. Richard Day, who was the National Medical Director of Planned Parenthood during the late 1960s, said this about the what the world needed in the future. And this is what he says about the future, ready? This is from the 1960s. Homosexuality will be promoted as being no longer abnormal behavior. Hard to cure diseases will be created. Hard to detect means have been created to produce heart attack assassinations. Drug addictions will be promoted so the unfit will die. 
euthanasia will be more acceptable as the cost of medical care will be made burdensome high, divorce will be made easier, ID badges will become more prevalent and eventually implanted under the skin as a transmitter and dental fillings. All payments will be done electronically by computers in one banking system. The major world religions, especially Christianity, will have to change into a new world religious system and one world church, and the church will bring it about. More airplane rail accidents as buildings and bridges collapse will continue to create an atmosphere of instability. Terrorism will be used to make people demand international controls, and economic independence will help lessen national sovereignty as people who want to become citizens of the world. That was written in the 1960s. In other words, that was written 61 years ago. Sounds a lot like today. It sounds like we are on course to this. There was a story, I believe, it was a National Geographic years ago of a Yemenite princess who was a wealth so wealthy they discovered her recently uh, they dug her up and they found her and she was filthy rich they deciphered the inscription on the tomb and she was a rich noble woman who was covered in jewels seven collars of pearls surrounded her neck her hands and feet covered with seven bracelets, armlets, ringlets, ankle rings, displaying costly jewels in addition to her tomb, contained a coffer filled with the treasure. However, the greatest treasure of all was a fascinating engraved stone tablet containing her final inscription, which concerned a biblical account of Joseph from Genesis and his careful management of the remaining food reserves during the seven years of famine in Egypt. It was 1800 years before Christ. The Yemenite inscription of the famine, it read this way. In thy name, O God, Hamyar, I, Taja, the daughter of Susaphar, send my steward to Joseph, and he delaying to return to me, I send my handmaid with a measure of silver to bring me back a measure of flour. And not being able to procure it, I send her with a measure of gold. Not being able to procure it, I send her with a measure of pearls. Not being able to procure it, I commanded them to be ground into finding no profit in them, and I am shut up here. Whosoever may hear of it, let them commiserate me. And should any woman adorn herself with an ornament from my ornaments, may she die with no other than my death. She had all the wealth in the world. And it meant nothing because Joseph wasn't willing to sell her grain. James chapter 5 says, now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth is rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. The wealthy will become wealthier. The poor will become poorer. But we are in the war not for wealth. We're in a war for the souls of men. Verse 14, they will say, The fruit you longed for is gone from you. All your luxury and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchants who said these things and gained their wealth from, from her will stand far off, terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city! dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea, will stand afar off. The cry 
will be the economic backbone of the world. It will be gone in one hour. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, was there ever a city like this? Great city. They will throw dust on their heads and with weeping and mourning cry out, woe, woe to you. Great city where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth and one hour she'd been brought to ruin. It does sound nuclear, doesn't it? God pronounces judgment on this city. Verse 20, rejoice over her, you heavens. Rejoice, you people of God. Rejoice, apostles and prophets, for God has judged her with the judgment she imposed on you that a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone, threw it into the sea, and said, With such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. This has never happened to Babylon. I said it last week, and I'm going to say it this week. This is future tense. Babylon has not yet to experience what these scriptures are saying. Revelation is an end times book. It's a future tense book. This is future tense. This is what Babylon will experience. Nowhere in history did it experience the things that it says in this book. It will come later on. This is end times. Verse 22. The music of harpists and musicians, pipers and trumpeters, will never be heard in you again. The worker of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. So there'll be no more amusement. It's done. When you muse, it's to think. Amuse is not to think. And we have whole industries based on helping us not to think. I enjoy mindless stuff to rest my thoughts. A mindless comedy. Sometimes a video game or a board game. Something where I don't have to think. Verse 23, the light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's important people. By your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. The merchants were the world's important people, not God's. The fullness, and the word there is magic in Greek. The fullness of pharmakia, the fullness of drug use, and people tell me, well, marijuana is natural. Well, there's a lot of other natural things in the world, like plutonium, for example. Why don't you go smoke some of that? Maybe put some hydrogen in a pipe and light a match. God does not want you smoking marijuana. The using of selling of drugs, it desensitizes us and makes us a mess or one chromosome short of a six pack. And there are four times in Revelation, which is an end times book, where it tells you that recreational drugs and pharmacia will be a major part of the end times and it will keep people out of heaven. I lived in the part of the country of Pennsylvania that had the most drug heroin deaths in the whole country. And when I was a volunteer fireman, that's what I did. We went and we helped people who were overdosing on heroin. That was the majority of the calls. The number one source of income in the world is weapons. The second is illegal drugs. The third is legal drugs. Verse 24. In her was found the blood of prophets and of God's holy people of all who have been slaughtered on the earth. What drove the city was gold, oil, economics. What drives the world? Through all this economy, is slain the blood of prophets and believers. There is a dark side to power. God's message to us tonight in chapter 18 is verse 4. And this is what it says. 
Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not conceive any of her plagues. Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 6, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? What do fellowship have with light and darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. You individually are the temple of the living God. I will live with them and walk among them. And I will be their God, God says. They will be my people. Therefore come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. It doesn't say come out of them or I'll give you a major beat down. You will be my sons and daughters. Here is the key to separation. You ready for this? Trying to be a Christian is not it. Because they look at their lives and go, well, I can't do this anymore, and I can't do that anymore, and then it becomes frustrating to the point of failure. How close can I get without going to hell? And it's a bummer I have to give things up. It's not the way to be a Christian, though. Separation is understanding of what he gave up so that we can be forgiven. It's separation unto and not separation from. If you look at your life and what you got to give up, then you have no perspective. When we fall in love for the first time, we clean ourselves up, we wear good clothes, we smell good. We, we air a different attitude and there's something different about us. It's no challenge for them to give up because their affections are towards some. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. What matters is our relationship and understanding what he, of what he did so that we could have it. All of God's holy wrath would pour it out on his son so we could have an opportunity to be with him forever. That should be our focus. Not, well, I guess I can only have one beer instead of two now. I have to give up so much. No. He gave up so much. And we don't deserve to go to heaven. We don't deserve God's love. But now we can because of what he gave for us. That's the understanding. That's what we deserve. We don't deserve anything. And this is important for all of us here to understand today. Is that if you try to give it up, you say, oh, I'm going to get, that's the worst part that we're, we're coming upon Lent. Lent was this week. And I'm telling you this, I gave up Lent for Lent. Because I did Lent the wrong way. The point of Lent is you give up something and when you give up something, you, you, you replace it with God. That's what Lent is. And then you get these people, well, I'm going to give up soda for Lent or I'm going to give up chocolate for Lent or I'm going to give up meat for Lent. Why are you doing that in your heart? Is it just an action? Well, I'm just giving it up. Or are you doing it for the Lord and replacing it with something? Maybe you're reading your Bible when you're not sitting there watching a certain program. Or maybe you're praying instead. The point is that Lent should draw you closer to God. That's why you give up something. That's why when we fast, I would rather fast television than food. Because I spend about maybe an average of 7 to 10 minutes eating something. You eat a meal normally in about 10 to 20 minutes if you're engulfing it down like most people do nowadays. 
But maybe if I give up television, which I gave up television for two weeks one time. Do you know how difficult that was? But in the time that I gave it up, I spent reading the Bible. I spent reading books on Christianity. I spent in prayer. And for those two weeks, I grew really close to the Lord. That's what giving up something is about. That is the important thing that we need to do in the Lord. So I hope if you gave up something for Lent that you're replacing it with God and his love. Because we don't do things because we want to do things. We do things because of what God did for us. Because he loves us. And because we love him, we give up those things. We don't, oh, I have to give up beer. Oh, I have to give up alcohol. Oh, I have to give up sexual immorality. Oh, no. Oh, I have to give up drugs. No, you give it up because God loves you and you want to please the Father. That's why we do it. Because we want to please God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this great message today. I ask, Lord, that you just continue to be with us. Lord, I know that there are people here who are struggling. They struggle with pornography or with um, smoking or doing drugs or smoking marijuana or whatever it may be, Lord. Some of us here are struggling with anger and bitterness. And, you know, those things make us sick and give us cancer, Father. But, Lord, we need to be able to have your forgiveness to be able to move forward. Lord, help us to love you. Help us to realize we don't have to do this or that, but we do it because we love you. We give up things because we love you and because you're God. And thank you, Lord, for that. We give you praise for that. And as we're going into Revelation 19, which is my favorite chapter of the whole Bible, I pray, Lord, that you would move in a mighty way and that you would give us an understanding of your great love. And I thank you for that and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the JTP. If you did, please like and subscribe. Thank you and may God bring whole healing through his whole...